And thank you for inviting me to do this lecture. I'm always very happy to talk about Vygotsky. I never need much, much of an invitation to start talking about him. And the context for this meeting is entirely appropriate um, for the book because it began here. It began here at the London Institute of Education where Harold Rosen taught in a department headed for several years by James Britton. And it was in that department that Britton ran what Harold called a unique seminar, which he described in a talk for NATE in 1994. And he writes, it was there we encountered Suzanne Langer, Piaget, Sapir, Polanyi, Vygotsky, Luria, Gustav, Firth, and others, an international invisible college of scholars, British, American, French, Swiss, German, Russian. Harold says, from that seminar, we shaped our convictions to be hospitable to the experiences and language of our students, to perceive literature as something not only received by our students, but as inevitably created by them, to consider the nature of expressive language, to understand why language is inextricably involved with learning. Harold's picture of the ferment of ideas in that department and how it translated into their discussion of practice in schools is a vivid evocation of those times. And I was lucky to particip participate initially through LATE in some of the life of the English department then with its international invisible college of scholars and its commitment to energising practice in schools. Those were the days when theory was regarded as a natural accompaniment to practice and where teachers and student teachers were encouraged to become informed professionals. It was a time before we had had enough of experts. And it was in that context, during my MA course with Tony Burgess as my teacher, that I first began to read Vygotsky through Mind in Society, a heavily edited cognitivist psychologist's collection of extracts from his work, and to read Thought and Language in the 1962 version, an edition so heavily cut that it was only half as long as the original. But we didn't know that then. And my experience of encountering Vygotsky and Luria at that time was transformative and in fact it became an obsession. There were obstacles to studying Vygotsky. In Russia, the long period under Stalin when his work was under a cloud, unpublished and subject to restricted access in libraries that had left a shadow. The feeling persisted that Vygotsky was a proscribed author, a questionable figure. Even after Stalin's death, for many years after Stalin's death, he was still regarded with suspicion and his work was not officially endorsed. So it's not surprising that Western psychologists visiting the Soviet Union, as Michael Cole did in 1962, encountered Russian psychologists whose attitude to Vygotsky was at worst critical and at best ambiguous always accepting Luria, who always did everything he could to make Vygotsky's work known beyond the Soviet Union. Even when in 1972, Luciano Macacci went to study in Moscow under Luria, as Cole had, the psychology department, the psychology laboratory was still named after Pavlov, who had become the official representative of Soviet psychology under, under Stalin. And the research students were reduced to passing around the works of Vygotsky and Luria in Samizdat copies. That was what they most wanted to read, but it wasn't available. And in the West, we were handicapped both by, by the availability of the texts and the hazards of the translations. But the more I read Vygotsky, first for my PhD and then for my own studies afterwards, as new texts were becoming available, the more dissatisfied I grew with the way in which mind and society had given a one-sided view of his thought. 
I was working on the short book Tool and Symbol, which is sometimes called Tool and Sign. And I was looking at how the Mind and Society editors had cut it, chopping chunks out of it to be two of the first three chapters in their book, and in doing so, misrepresenting Vygotsky and Luria's overall argument. I came to think of Mind and Society as an unreliable text, and I wanted to look at other chapters to see how far they were true to Vygotsky's original texts. And I was amazed to find that there seemed to be no other translation of chapter six, the interaction between learning and development, probably the most famous chapter in the book, because it deals with the subject which became Vygotsky's most famous idea, the zone of proximal development, which I'm not going to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) Um, As I prefer it, the zone of proximate development. By now, I was in correspondence with Nikolai Verasov, and I asked him to send me a copy of the original 1935 text, and I got it almost by return of email. And once I received it, I had to commission a translation, and I was very fortunate to be introduced to Stanley Mitchell, who had recently translated Eugene Onegin um, for Penguin, and he accepted the the task of translating it and completed the translation in 2011. And I went away and compared it word by word with the Mind and Society version and found very significant differences. Notably, the total omission in Mind and Society of Vygotsky's emphasis on the role of the teacher and of the word pedagogy and eventually both Stanley's translation and my commentary on it were published in Changing English in 2017. I was developing a picture of Vygotsky's ideas and his priorities that was different in several ways from that presented by some of the best known commentators in the field. I felt a complete outsider, lacking Russian, lacking a foundation in psychology. Yet I believed that some of Vygotsky's main preoccupations were being neglected or sidelined. And the first part of my talk today, which if you've got a hymn sheet, if you've got a hymn sheet, you'll see is part one. Part one is about neglected aspects of Vygotsky's work and thought. What were the main aspects of Vygotsky's work that I felt had been neglected or ignored? The first was art, or literature, um, as it mostly means when it figures in his work, and emotion. Because psychologist commentators in both Russia and the West had largely ignored Vygotsky's book, Psychology of Art. Despite its title, it was left out of the collected works, and it wasn't admitted to the main body of his psychology. In Van der Veer and Valsener, the book proper begins after that, and it's, co- it's confined to the introduction. Um, but I included it in my PhD, and I was particularly struck by the shapeliness of its argument and the beauty of its writing. This book, which was based on his doctoral thesis and was not published until 1965, 31 years after his death, argued very strongly that literature should count as legitimate evidence in the study of mind. Vygotsky set out to identify the psychological laws of works of art and to examine how they work on us. It was a hugely ambitious project and it was designed to broaden the concept of evidence in psychology because Vygotsky thought that that was needed. Yet, Alexei Leontiev, in his introduction to the book in 1965, suggests that, have we got that right? Vygotsky clearly saw the incompleteness and imperfections of his work. And that was why it wasn't published, according to him. And said that much of the content of Vygotsky's book has already been superseded. Leontiev was never in sympathy with Vygotsky's attempts to broaden psychology by giving full recognition to the importance of language on the one hand and emotion on the other. 
<laughs> Literature, and especially poetry and drama, was a passion of Vygotsky's from his earliest years. Both when he was growing up in his highly literate home in Gomel, now in Belarus, and through his whole period at university in Moscow, where he studied literature and psychology at Shanyavsky University and um, law at Moscow University. And he never missed a production at the Moscow Art Theatre. He engaged with contemporary developments in poetry, literature and drama. After he returned to his hometown, in addition to a full program of teaching, because it was now possible for him to teach, um, because the provisional government under Kerensky had revoked the laws, which made it um, it made it illegal for Jews look for Jews to hold public office. Um, so when he went back to Gomel, um, in addition to a full program of teaching, he became a regional organizer for the theatre section of Gomel Department of Public Education, and he also set up with his cousin. David Vygotsky, a small poetry publishing press. David was a translator of literature and poetry from French, Spanish, German and Hebrew, and he was a friend of Russian poets like Anna Akhmadova and Azit Mandrushtal. Vygotsky shared those literary interests, and they also fed into his ideas about psychology. He believed that literature gave indispensable insights into the role of emotions in human development and in the psychology of art he wrote art is the social technique of emotion a tool of society which brings the most intimate and personal aspects of our being into the circle circle of social life in the psychology of art he sets out to analyze how three individual works of art works of literature in ascending order of complexity engages in situations which develop through emotional contradictions and conflicts and enable us to experience these on what he described as a completely real emotional basis. Vygotsky went on writing about the imagination, play and literature for the rest of his life, which was of course very short. He lived only 10 years after he moved to Moscow in 1924 so he died at the age of 37. He'd contracted tuberculosis from his younger brother, who had died in, 20, in 1917, and whom he'd helped to nurse. He himself became seriously ill with it in 1920, and from then on he knew that the tuberculosis was likely to recur at any time and be serious, and that he would not enjoy a long life. So, second point, second um, thing that I thought had been neglected, um, education and pedagogy. So secondly then, the commentators on Vygotsky had largely passed over his teaching experience in Goma. He'd worked as a teacher of vocational courses, he was teaching logic and philosophy, language and literature in vocational schools for printers and steel and metal workers. He was teaching aesthetics to rural cultural workers and logic and psychology to kindergarten teachers. And later he, be he became a lecturer at Gomo Teachers College where he taught Russian literature and psychology. He had a reputation as an outstanding teacher and he was given a an award as the best teacher in Gomo province. So he had seven practical years as a teacher and a teacher of teachers before he went to Moscow in 1924 and joined the staff at the Mons Moscow Institute of Psychology where his career as a psychologist is generally thought to have begun. But he'd written a book, Educational Psychology, based on his lectures at Gomo College in which the beginning chapters show a very thorough knowledge of contemporary psychology known then as reflexology or perhaps re reactology, and the book takes a decidedly critical attitude towards that narrow behaviourist science. What kind of a teacher was Vygotsky? We can see something of his style in his book. He believed that interest 
was the natural moving force of the child's behaviour, the true expression of instinctive striving. And therefore he thought that the entire structure of the entire education system, the entire structure of teaching, should be constructed on the foundation of children's interests. Note. He was also a brilliant and engaging university teacher who could hold a lecture audience captive. But one of his research students remembered him like this. How did Lev Simeonovich teach his fellow workers, his pupils and his students? He did not pontificate to them, but taught them, by example, how to approach science and analyse children through analytic examples given at conferences, by the way he did experiments, and through the attention he devoted to people. Vygotsky was not a laid-back teacher. He would never have called himself a facilitator, and I think he would have disapproved of the word. He didn't think that the job of teaching was to make things easy. He was interventive. He was much more interested in providing what we might call appropriate challenges for children in the strong belief that such challenges would spur them into going beyond what they could normally do. This approach is evident in the experiments described in Vygotsky's and Luria's later book, Tool and Symbol, and it's part, of course, of his idea of the ZPD, which I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> and the third issue that I thought had been seriously neglected in work on him, um, in the academic work on him, was defectology and special needs. Now, Vygotsky didn't like the term defectology any more than modern students of his work did, do, but he used it because it was the ex accepted term at that time. And it was the other area of his work which was underplayed in, in work about his psychology. It was often treated as secondary to his work in psychology proper. But in fact, he worked continuously in the field of defectology from 1924 right through to his death. He held posts in the, in the subject. He was teaching in the subject. He was, he was teaching at clinics, working with children, um, as a, as a clinical psychologist in that area. And as soon as he arrived in Moscow to teach at the, um, uh, to work at the Moscow Institute, he was appointed additionally um, by the Ministry of Education and Culture to a post as head of the sector for the education of physically and mentally handicapped children, initially with a special emphasis on the education of blind and deaf children. He worked in that sector as a spokesman, as an advocate, as a researcher, and as a clinical psychologist and assessing children. And soon after his first appointment, he began organizing a laboratory for the study of abnormal children, which eventually became the Experimental Defectological Institute, the EDI, with Vygotsky as scientific director. He was a respected theorist in this field, and the afterward to volume two of the collected works that deals with defectology makes clear the amazing extent of his achievement and his influence and the way he helped to change the culture that had held back the education of children with difficulties in the Soviet system. And that afterward, which was written by the editors of the volume, several of whom, most of whom, were ex-students of Vygotsky, stresses his hands-on approach to the work. The edit editor's remark, it is impossible to understand Vygotsky's profound interest in the problems of child and age group psychology without taking into account that he was both a theoretician and particularly importantly a practitioner in the area of anomalous mental development. Hundreds of children with the most various of de developmental uh, anomalies passed through his consultations. I think that uh, that quote is the one that most represents what I want to say about Bogotsky. Right the way through his career, he was both. He was a brilliant theorist, but he was also an experienced practitioner 
as a teacher, as a psychologist, and as a defectologist. And he kept, uh, he kept in touch with all those things right the way through, and they hugely illuminated, informed one another. Vygotsky designed diagnostic protocols as a framework for his structured observations and conversations with the children that he was, he was meeting. And how extraordinarily valuable those protocols would have been in allowing us to see into his clinical practice. But tragically, all of the completed pro protocols which had been carefully preserved by his colleagues were lost or destroyed, probably during the siege of Leningrad. We can get a glimpse of his approach to these children from the account given by Lev Zankov, one of his original re research students, who later went on to be a very effective school principal in Moscow. And I, I, I've, one of the surprises and excitements for me in writing the book was to come across Zankov later on running a school um, among, along very progressive educational lines. And I, I thought that was, you know, that was the bit of the book that really gave me most, most of a thrill. And, and Lev said about him, about his, 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 uh, his approach in these interviews with children, diagnostic interviews with children. This was an involving, very personal converse with the little one, and always with an underlying theme, this child is not well, he needs to be helped. Vygotsky was always able to establish an atmosphere of trust in his rapport with children, he always talked to them as though they were equals, always paid attention to their answers, and in turn, the children opened up to him in a way they never did with other examiners. Vygotsky's strong conviction, which he developed into a comprehensive theory, was that while deficits or handicaps can often not be reversed, blindness and deafness, they can be got round through what he called detours. The Russian editors of the Defectology volume say, what interested Vygotsky was a child's potential, not his handicap. Previously, much of teaching in this field had focused on the handicap. Vygotsky ignored it. He wanted to go around it. The children's difficulties might be biological, but the means of circumventing them must be cultural. And the main detours by which handicaps could be circumvented were first socialisation and then above all language, whatever its form, rail, sign. So Vygotsky recognised that language would give children who were sometimes isolated by their handicap a way of interacting with a wider society. It would give them access to knowledge and broader possibilities of learning. The role of language in mental development became his guiding principle in all his subsequent areas of research. This work influenced everything that Vygotsky went on to do in relation to mental development at all ages. So those are the three aspects of his work that I think have generally been given too little weight in accounts of his psychology, his passion for literature, and the desire for literature and the arts to be counted as evidence in psychology. His experience as a teacher as reflected in education, educational psychology and his focus elsewhere on pedagogy, on the crucial role of the teacher, and his lifelong experience in and commitment to defectology and the influence of his work in defectology on his mainstream psychology. Those three aspects were not confined to his early life in psychology and they were certainly not sidelines. They ran through all his work I made them the topic of the first three chapters of my book. Part two, practice and theory. So far I've mainly been discussing Vygotsky's rootedness in practice, especially in teaching and in the practice of defectology. But in part two, we're going to be alternating theoretical interludes with some close-ups of practice. Vygotsky was naturally somebody with a, an abstracting mind. He was an omnivorous reader. It's somehow very fitting 
that he grew up in a library or with a library in the building where the family lived. It was a library that his father had founded. And indeed, when he first moved to Moscow, he and his wife actually lived and slept for a few months in a library in the basement of the Moscow Institute of Psychology. Ekaterina Zaveshneva's publication of Vygotsky's notebooks provides us with a window into Vygotsky's thinking in his clinical work with children at the EDI, the Experimental Defectological Institute. In his observational notes on individual children, Vygotsky continually relates his observations to his very wide reading in psychology, referring to Russian and German psychologists, but also to Swiss, Austrian, French, Belgian, and American work. His mind moved naturally between practice and theory. It's like watching you know, a, a, a bouncing ball. He, he touches on uh, a very, very close observation of a child, and then his mind shoots up, and he connects it immediately to two or three um, authorities or theories that he's, 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 he's rotating, you know, he's, he's considering. So we're going to look at a, a, an interlude in his life where he was very high, heavily focused on theory, and that was the book, The Historical Meaning of the Crisis in Psychology. In the theoretical work that he embarked on in 1924 um, to 1927, he drew on all his reading in psychology. And the theoretical work he set himself was nothing less than redefining the discipline of psychology itself. In 1924, he was taking up a post at an institute where the psychology studied and practiced was a form of reflexology, an objective, scientific discipline um, modelled on the natural sciences and in which the aim was to eliminate subjectivity in the researchers and in the findings although they concerned human subjects. The subjects had to answer standardised questions and introspection was not allowed. Vygotsky was very dissatisfied with this approach which <coughs> restricted psychology to the study of what he called the narrow circle of the physiology of the nervous system. It was indeed partly based on the work of Pav Pavlov, who studied the nervous systems of animals. So Vygotsky wrote a series of critical texts, lectures, on the subject of the reform of psychology and what needed to be done to make it a broader and also a less divided discipline. He had two jobs to do. First of all, he had to overcome the problem of the split in psychology, which had been apparent for many years, a split between what was called idealistic psychology, theoretical psychology, often based on introspection or discussions with human subjects, typified by the work of William James, and scientific psychology, such as reflexology, which consciously rejected this kind of subjective thinking and took Pavlov's reflexology with its strict focus only on behaviour which can be observed and, of course, measured um, as its model. The second job he had was to reform the methodology in use in psychological investigations so that he was more flexible, more open to examining human responses, more adept at finding indirect but effective ways to explore the workings of the mind. Methodology was always a central concern for Vygotsky. He wrote very, two very fine articles on these issues, and the second one, which was called Consciousness as a Problem for the Psychology of Behaviour, confronted directly a question that continued to preoccupy him for the rest of his life, and Benjamin Lee describes it like this. Vygotsky's life goal was to create a psychology that would be theoretically and methodologically adequate for the investigation of consciousness. And at the same time, he was planning a major book, The Historical Meaning of the Crisis in Psychology, on the reform of the general discipline of psychology. In 1926, he had ample time to think at length about this because for six months in that year, he was in hospital being treated for a serious attack of tuberculosis. <coughs> 
His notebooks from that period show that he was making notes on this huge subject, despite his illness. Vygotsky had taken the epigraph for his paper on consciousness from Marx. It was a quote about the difference between the bee and the architect in their ways of building. Marx had written, what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in the imagination before he erects it in reality. So in the crisis in psychology, we can see Vygotsky, like the architect, raising the structure of a future psychology in his imagination, in preparation for erecting it in reality, which is what he went on to do. This book was probably completed in 1927, but it wasn't published in his lifetime. Indeed, it wasn't published until 1987. Uh, in the Russian Collected Works, and that was 1997 in English. And in it, he critiques, in turn, all the major schools of psychology. And eventually, after a fraught argument with himself, opted for a strictly scientific approach, but a much more sophisticated and forward-looking one than that adopted by reflexology. In the crisis in psychology, Vygotsky finds the mean of means of resolving the conflict between idealistic psychology and scientific psychology in the work of Marx, and especially in Marx's concept of praxis or practice. It was through this idea that psychology must be responsible and coherent for those who use psychology in their work, as Vygotsky did as a defectologist as we do in teaching, that he arrived at the conclusion that there could only be one psychology which would necessarily be both scientific and Marxist in character. So in these texts, in all these texts, Vygotsky argued effectively against the prevailing scientific psychology, reflexology, and prepared for new departures with new methodologies to explore the workings of the mind. So now let's have a close-up, a close-up on practice. Um, and it's a glimpse. We're going to look at some of Vygotsky's <coughs> best-known work, the research into the development of higher mental functions, using what Vygotsky and Luria termed the instrumental method. What Vygotsky went on to do then in the late 1920s was to direct a substantial research project based at the Communist Institute of Education in the department headed by Alexander Luria. This research was written up by Vygotsky and Luria in an important and accessible short book, often known as Tool and Symbol, but also known in the collected works as Tool and Sign, in volume six. Um, Tool and Symbol, is available online still, it's out of print, but it's available online in the Marxist Reader, uh, in the Marxist Archive, a very admirable website, which I thoroughly recommend to you. There's a Vygotsky section, um, a wonderful Vygotsky section. Vygotsky then was working with a small troika, which included Luria, Leontiev and himself, and a wider research team, including Rosa Levina, Natalia Morozova, Alexander Zaporozets, and also other researchers such as Zankov and Sakharov. And all of these are names that recur in Vygotsky's story. The team set out to explore children's mental development through a method that Vygotsky and Luria called the instrumental method. It consisted of giving children tasks, problems, which were always presented as games or puzzles, which were essentially beyond their capabilities. Most were aged five or six. And the idea was that the intense difficulties experienced by the children would generate intense efforts to solve the problem. Vygotsky was transferring to the mainstream his insights from defectology. To help them in these tasks, children were offered auxiliary stimuli, or signs, 
in various forms, sometimes colour cards, sometimes pictures or shapes, which they could use to help them. They were not necessarily instructed in how to use them, and the individual experiments were designed to focus on different separate mental functions such as memory, perception, attention, and so on. Through these signs, the instruments provided, which they used as mnemonics or as ways of directing their own attention, um, the children became capable of conscious attention, voluntary perception, and logical memory. These were the higher mental functions. Um, whereas animals also exhib exhibited perception, attention, and memory in their behavior, they were not able to control and direct their behavior consciously, as human subjects learned to do. The experiments were ingeniously designed, and the methods used were indirect. The children engaged with the tasks, and they found inventive ways of using the auxiliary signs. They were sometimes very vocal subjects, treating the researcher who was observing them as a friend, talking to them, seeking help, showing their awareness of the social and human nature of the situation. Vygotsky and Luria stressed the social nature of the interactions between the child and the researcher, and sometimes the affective or emotional nature. Many of the observations of children's behavior in these experiments are highly sensitive to their responses. For instance, Natalia Moldova's experiments on choice looked at the way children choose which key to press on a keyboard in response to a particular stimulus. She found that initially, the whole process of selection is a motor process. The child's only strategy is through a, a series of trial movements, and her description of this is very beautiful and delicate. The child solves its problem of selection, not in perception, but in movement, hesitating between two stimuli, its fingers hovering above and moving from one key to another, going halfway and then coming back. But as soon as the task of selection is made simpler by marking each key with a corresponding sign, the child can use the sign to fulfill the task with greatest ease. Vygotsky and Luria also noted that in the course of the experiments, the examined activity of the child changes, not only perfecting itself, as is the case in the process of teaching, but undergoing such great qualitative changes as can only be regarded in their totality as development. And they observe, this represented an unpleasant complication for all psychologists who at any cost endeavoured to preserve the invariability of the examined activity. But for us, it at once became central and we concentrated all our attention on it. The reference to an unpleasant complication must be tongue in cheek. These experiments were provoking and stimulating development in children by presenting them with tasks beyond their capabilities. And this enabled the researchers to study development in all its variety and complexity. This passage was omitted from mind in society, perhaps because it revealed too frankly the unorth unorthodox by behaviourist standards nature of the experiment. In these experiments, where the children's ability to solve problems was supported by the use of science, these signs were a proxy for language. Vygotsky and Luria's developing theory was that language was the main route or mediator of mental de development. The experiments were an essential step in Vygotsky's study of the role of language in mental development. They were also a way of actually studying development as it happened. So the next little bit is about pedology. Um, and we don't know nearly as much about this aspect of Vygotsky's work um, as we do about some of the others. Indeed, we haven't heard the word really very much, have we? Um, and when the collected works were published, pedology was nowhere mentioned. And the, uh, all the 
works that one of the Gotsky that were in it that had pedology in the title were all changed. Um, the volume itself was called Child Science, and that was the name by which afterwards um, this science came to be um, described. But that was because of uh, a crisis which I'll later discuss. Pedology was an international movement. It had spread all over Europe and Amer America in the late 19th century, but it had only really been taken up in Russia after 1918. It advocated the study of the whole child, not only their mental development, but also physical and emotional development. It involved professionals working with children in many fields, pediatrics, physiology, psychology, education, sociology. Um, the person who, who's written a great deal about this and done a lot of study on, in it is Andrew Byford, Andy Byford at um, Durham University, who has um, a, a whole project on child science. Vygotsky was completely in favour of this kind of interdisciplinary <coughs> approach. So his work in pedology was really an extension of his work in both defectology and in psychology. And what's more, his work with older children through the EDI and the other clinics had brought him in contact with adolescents and he had been struck by the fact that development was not a smooth process but was often characterized, characterized by discontinuities, gaps and crises. And the first text in volume one of the collected work, in volume five of the collected works, which is made up of pedological texts, so the word pedology is never mentioned, is an extract from Vygotsky's book, The Pedology of Adolescence. Some of the insights from this volume related to changes in adolescence mental development. And by adolescence, which he called the transitional age, higher mental functions were largely internalized and now thinking had prime, prime place. And concept development, which took place over a considerable time, several years, led students to a larger and more comprehensive view of the world. It enabled them also to inter interrelate concepts. It was the key to mental development in adolescence and beyond. Vygotsky discusses how this development can be studied through a methodology which he terms a comparative genetic method in which it's like slicing a sausage. Developmental slices, slices of their development are taken at different, by observations at different stages um, and when compared can show a picture of growth. Pedology was not only concerned with mental development then but with affective development and crucially with personality. Vygotsky's most famous example of this is a paper entitled the problem of the environment, and it relates to three children of an alcoholic, mentally ill, and abusive mother who beats them. And each child experiences this situation differently, and each presents a completely different picture of developmental disorder. This paper is often given as a clear example of perugivani, emotional or lived experience. In the rest of the volume, Vygotsky writes about younger children and their development, and he sees development as being marked by a series of crises, typical of particular ages. He was fascinated by these crises that he saw occurring not invariably in all children, but frequently enough to enable generalizations to be made. He writes about the positive as well as the negative aspects of crises. For example, he cites the example um, from his clinical work of the four-year-old son of a streetcar conductor who exhibits extreme despotism. Everything that he wanted had to be done precisely, e.g. when he walked along the street with his mother, he wanted her to pick up a paper that was lying on the ground, although he did not need the paper at all. When his wishes are denied in the clinical situation, he throws himself on the floor begins to scream wildly and pound with his hands and feet. This kind of regressive behaviour is given by Vygotsky as an example of how these crises 
are often crises of social relations. Um, attempts to reconstruct the social relations with the people around him. Attem sometimes attempts to dominate and dictate. Sometimes rebellions against being treated as a powerless baby, as less than a person. Vygotsky became a completely committed, active, and practicing pedologist on the board of the journal Pedology, writing as many pedological works as psychological works, not all of which, which have yet been translated, though this is changing. But in the early 1930s, involvement with pedology became dangerous, and in 1936, after Vygotsky's death, following the Stalin decree, on pedology, its practice was banned and its theorists were criticised. After his death in 1934, Vygotsky's associations with pedology, which were close and, and absolutely open, led to criticism and prescribing of his work. And this was one explanation of the long neglect of his work that followed. And finally, I think, a glimpse of theory and the paper on psychological systems. Vygotsky never, never uh, stopped thinking about mental development, and by 1930, he was dissatisfied with the research described in Torn and Symbol on higher mental functions. And he wrote a talk addressed to his colleagues and given in October 1930, um, which was entitled On Psychological Systems. You'll find it in the Marxist archive. He wanted them to go beyond their previous work. He wanted to look at development beyond high mental functions. He himself had become aware of the connections between the, these functions in the process of development in adolescence and so on. And it was these networks, it was these psychological systems that he now wanted to study. He says at the start of the paper, somewhat disingenuously, that he had no real theoretical conception to offer, only a certain, he says, only a certain ladder of facts to present. And in what, I, what follows, I'll keep to the line of his argument, but I'll condense it considerably. First of all, he points out that it's nonsense to think that the higher mental functions their research has been investigated do not interact and develop structural connections. One affects the other. And he says, my report is dedicated to this very theme. Its main and extremely simple idea is that in the process of development and in the historical development of behaviour in particular, it's not so much the functions that change, these were mistakenly studied before, their structure and the system of their development remain the same. What is changed and modified are rather the relationships, the links between the functions. It's the interfunctional changes, the changes of interfunctional connections and the interfunctional structure which matter. So children in the memory experiments which draw on other functions, such as imagination, such as the perception of differences and so on, in their problem solving. And in the process, these connections and relationships become changed and that is the foundation of a new system. Secondly, Vygotsky had gained new evidence from his experience in pedology working with adolescents and he'd found differences between young children and adolescents in relation to higher psychological functions. And he said, Whereas the thinking of the pre-adolescent pre child rested on memory, and to think means to remember, for the adolescent, memory rests mainly on thinking. To remember is first of all to search for what's needed in a certain logical order. This rearrangement of functions, the change of their relationships, the leading role of thinking in absolutely all functions, as a result of which thinking turns out to be not just one function among another of a number of others, but a function which restructures and changes others, other psychological processes we observe in adolescence. So we wanted to take account of the unceasing changes in relationships 
between mental functions and their relationship to development. The next step up the ladder was concept development, which she said fully ripens and takes shape first in adolescence and forms the key to all processes of development and loss. To have mature concepts meant to have a view of the whole system of which the concept is a part. If you think about it, you'll see that that's true. You can't have a single concept in a vacuum. It's always connected. And, and gradually your, your map of the world becomes more interconnected and complex. Um, so he wanted to, to have developed mature concepts, he says, meant, meant to have a, li a view of the whole system of which the concept is a part, and thus an increasingly coherent intellectual view of the world. The next step on the ladder, Vygotsky took from his work with older people. He'd become very interested in what happens when functions break down, um, as happens in Parkinson's disease or in dementia. This can lead to a breakdown of complex mental systems. It can lead to regression, and these cases indirectly can lead, shed light on development. He then goes on, this, I think this is the next step, to suggest that higher mental functions must work together in networks. They cannot be discrete or partitioned off from one another. They interact, and in so doing, they form psychological systems. And now that's what he wants to study. And that's what he wants to persuade his colleagues to follow him into. He wants to propose that they should study together these systems and the interrelationships between them. And in a final mental leap to the top of the ladder, Vygotsky hypothesizes that as functions make new links, there must be some physiological correspondence to this at the level of the brain. He summarizes the course of development that he's been reviewing. Each of the systems I mentioned, he says, goes through three stages. First, an interpsychological stage, I order, you, ex you execute. Then an extra psychological stage, I begin to speak to myself. Then an intra psychological stage. Two points of the brain, which are excited from outside, have the tendency to work together in a unified system and turn into an intracortical point. Because he is developing a hypothesis about how new connections, which we might call neural connections, between different parts of the brain are established. He suggests that joint activity involving separate brain areas, which occurs in the development of psychological systems, might lead to the formation of intracortical points. And Tatiana Akutina calls this idea the beginning of neuropsychology. This was the aspect of their joint work that Luria went on to study for the rest of his life. Vygotsky would have been very interested in some of the work being done by people like Antonio Damasio today. Vygotsky wants his colleagues to leave their work on high mental functions behind and join him in, the, in investigating the formation of psychological systems. But his colleagues were reluctant. They felt confident that the work they'd been doing was still valid and capable of being developed further. Some of them had de de decided to go and work in Kharkov, or as we are now learning to call it, Kharkiv, where Leontiev and Luria had been invited to set up a new psychology department in the university. Some may have felt that Vygotsky's vision was too radical and difficult to research, even politically dangerous. But he continued to work with the idea of psychological systems and their interrelationship. And this paper strikes me of great importance to any understanding of his later work. When Vygotsky came to write his lecture on the imagination, he enlarged this idea further. In his argument, he suggests that the imagination plays a crucial part in thinking by freeing thought and allowing it to go beyond the limits of reality. Consequently, he proposes that the imagination 
should be regarded as a higher mental function. And even as it operates often in conjunction with emotion, that together they could be termed a psychological system. This would have been a pretty revolutionary step to take and would probably not have been accepted by most of his fellow psychologists. And that's the end of part two, which point if you don't mind. Part three is about thought and language, or thinking and speech in the collected work. Um, his last book, which was completed in hospital as he was dying of tuberculosis. Uh, look at the way in which he drew on so much of his past practical work and on his thinking and theorizing in a long argument that goes through this book. I believe that it brings together much of what he wanted to say through his psychology about the construction of the mind in an increasingly condensed way towards the end of the book. I can only offer you a summary here and each area I refer to should be explored in much more depth but for now we'll just be able to look at the big shapes, the overall argument and its significance. He planned this book carefully as he did all his complete texts. He intended to use one cell not just the word, but word meaning, in order to build a wide-reaching wide -reaching analysis of the interfunctional relation between thought and language. This cell was his unit of analysis. In the cell is the union of thinking and speech, word meaning. Vygotsky suggests that psychology has not researched interfunctional relations in the mind in any detail, and still less the overall structure of consciousness of which they form a part. In the first chapter of Thought and Language, Vygotsky remarks, there is, of course, nothing new in the notion that consciousness is a unified whole, that the separate functions are linked with one another in activity. But he pointed out that the unified nature of consciousness, the connections among the mental functions, have simply been taken as a given. He made clear that in this book, his aim would be to explore these connections in more detail and to do so particularly through the study of the developing relationship between thinking and speech. And I hope you can hear in these familiar words from thought and language, the words of the paper on psychological systems that came just before. There's a definite overall theory emerging here, which is very, very interesting. Um, so, since the beginning of his life in psychology, of course, he'd been seeking ways of studying the structure of consciousness. And this is where he's going to make some kind of approach to it. He describes the plan of his book. First of all, there's going to be an investigation of the interrelationship of thought and language in young children their language development and the gradual internalization of their speech. Secondly, there are going to be studies of the long process of concept development in older children in adolescence and how the development of word meaning is fundamental to the mastery of concepts, especially formal scientific concepts. These areas of investigation concern the way in which word meanings become more defined and precise and form a fundamental part of thinking both at the early stages of development and in later stages of school and adulthood. Much of his argument in this book is set up in opposition to Piaget, whom he respects as a researcher but disagrees with profoundly as a theorist. And that's why it was peculiarly perverse of the editors of this edition of Thought and Language to leave out nearly every reference to Piaget. Thirdly, in this last book, Vygotsky also wanted to follow what happens to language as it is internalized, and to speculate about the late processes of internalization, what happens in the mind as language becomes first inner speech, then verbal thought, 
then thought itself. This is the subject of the last chapter of the book. And in that chapter, Vygotsky makes clear the role that affect and emotion play in the engendering of thought. This is something that he wanted to write an entire book about, never managed it, but here he firmly puts it into the middle. He firmly gives affect and emotion the central place in the system of consciousness that he is committed to studying. Thought, he says, has as its origins in the motivating sphere of consciousness, a sphere that includes our inclinations and needs, our interests and impulses, and our affect and emotion. The affective and volitional tendency stands behind thought. Only here do we find the answer to the final why in the analysis of thinking. The whole of the last chapter is studied with examples, many from poetry, of the dense private nature of thought, which is saturated with feeling. That's what poetry and literature have to draw. In the last pages of the chapter, consciousness is seen as a metastructure, an overarching system containing all psychological systems. His whole psychology has been a project of tracing how mental functions develop and work together in interfunctional networks, always um, of increasing complexity, always growing and forming new links. It's often acknowledged that the discussion of consciousness in this last chapter is abbreviated, so abbreviated as to be sometimes enigmatic. And I really do now wish that in my book I've made more, more reference here to one of the places in the book where Vygotsky makes more explicit his model of the construction of consciousness. It comes in chapter 6 at around pages 187, 89, 187 to 189 in volume 1 which is his discussion of conscious awareness, a very, very interesting and illuminating passage in the study of concept development. However, in the closing pages of the book, he makes clear that like everything else in his model of mind, language is, the int is an intrinsic part of the process. Conscious is brought, consciousness is brought into being and developed as all thought is by language. If language is as ancient as consciousness itself, if language is consciousness that exists in practice for other people and therefore for myself, then it is not only the development of thought, but the development of consciousness as a whole that is connected with the development of the word. Kotsky, who was too ill to write, was dictating these last pages of thought and word thought and language, in which his thought is highly condensed, from his hospital bed. He was determined to complete the book, to present a unified argument about the unified nature of consciousness. That was what his life's work had been directed to. The book was published immediately after his death in 1935, but thereafter, because of the pedology decree, his work fell out of favour. And though it was kept in specialist libraries, would-be readers had to sign to read it. Imagine what that would have been like in Stalinist Russia. Several books were withdrawn from libraries at that time with a rubber stamp saying that this had been done because of regulations on pedagogical perversions. Another edition of Thought and Language was published in 1956 after Stalin's death. But Vygotsky's word, words were edited by Leontiev and Luria. There were omissions, and terms like pedology disappeared from the text. All sub subsequent texts and translations, including the collected works in English, were based on that edition. We are still waiting for an accurate translation of the complete text, except in Italy. Because Luciana Macacci had met Gita Vygotskaya, Vygotsky's daughter, in an hotel in Moscow in the 1980s, and she had given him a copy of the original 1935 book, preserved by her mother and herself ever since Vygotsky's death. <laughs> 
So the Italian edition, Pensiero e Linguaggio, translated by McCutcheon, is as yet the only one from the original text. So a new collected works is now being prepared in Russia. Fortunately, my second language is Italian, so I was able to consult McCutcheon's translation in the writing of my book. In this talk, I've tried to give an account of Vygotsky's psychology, which reflects in a very condensed way the argument of my book. I see Vygotsky's work as a coherent whole, where certain themes, preoccupations, and convictions are always present. Those of you who are here today are lucky enough to be able to read several of Vygotsky's books in good translations. The next generation of Vygotsky scholars will encounter better texts and fewer obstacles. Ninety years after Vygotsky's death, they will be in a position to read his work as he wrote it.